what are you leaving behind? What have you done in your lifetime that will make other generations celebrate their living or enjoy their stay on earth? That's really what makes the difference. You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. I'm sure you've all heard of Fridays for Future, which is a youth-led and youth-organized movement that began in August 2018. This movement was inspired by 15-year-old Greta Thunberg and other young activists who sat in front of the Swedish parliament every school day for three weeks to protest against the lack of action on the climate crisis. Now, while Greta has become a household name, there are many other young activists around the world who are also making a vital contribution by pressuring their governments to undertake climate action. My guest this week, Hilda Flavia Nakabuye, is one of these inspiring young African leaders. While pursuing her university studies in Kampala, Uganda, Hilda began to acquire a nuanced understanding of the causes of unpredictable rainy seasons, frequent heat waves, droughts, and floods that she had witnessed growing up in southern Uganda. Indeed, she began connecting the dots and realized that much of what she and her family had experienced and what her country continues to experience was and is caused by climate disruption. She therefore decided to become a climate and environmental rights activist and founded Uganda's Fridays for Future movement in 2019. Hilda and I began by discussing how she understands the concept of development and the extent to which there is a potential trade-off between development and environmental issues. Thereafter, we addressed issues of climate injustice, the work of the Fridays for Future movement in Uganda, and what Hilda and her fellow youth activists think about this hugely ambitious project called the East African Crude Oil Pipeline, ECOP, that is currently underway in her country. I hope you're enjoying season four and that you will enjoy this conversation I had recently with Hilda Flavia Nakabuye. Hilda, good morning in New York, and it's still morning here in Oslo. It is so lovely to see you. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for having me. Well, I really enjoyed our chat a few weeks ago. We were on a panel, and I was so impressed with many of the perspectives that you highlighted there. One of the big issues that I know I'm grappling with as much as many of my colleagues are grappling with is how do we promote both economic development and take care of the environment and be concerned with climate change issues? How do we promote all of this at the same time? Or is it a matter of thinking about these issues as trade-offs, that something has to come first and some other stuff will have to come later. What are your thoughts there? How can we promote development and environmental issues? Well, for me, when it comes to this, I would think that the best way to handle this is looking at priorities. What are we prioritizing? Are we prioritizing development or are we prioritizing economic growth? Because one thing depends on the other. We can't say that we will have economic growth without having, you know, a clean and safe environment. We can't have that because that will affect our lives, our way of being. It will affect everything, even the economic growth that we are looking at. So one thing is for real that we need to prioritize the environment in which we are staying for us to have economic growth. 
because we cannot live on a wrecking planet if everything is not going well, if our environments are not safe, if our lives are not safe, if we are not healthy, then we cannot have economic growth either. So we need to understand our priorities and also focus on making the right decisions. Yeah, we depend on our environment for survival, for a living, for everything. So that means in order for us to be well, our environment has to be well. And if it's not, then we cannot be well. And that means we can't have economic growth either. So one of the questions that I often ask my guests, and this week, actually, my guest is the chief economist of the World Bank. I ask almost everyone, how do you understand development? Is development the same as economic growth? Is development economic growth plus distribution of that growth? And I'm asking you this because on the African continent, you still have hundreds of millions of people living in poverty. Yeah. Whenever I visit any of the countries on the continent, including Uganda, the first thing that people say is we need more development. So how do you and your fellow members of Africa's youth, how do you now see development? Mm -hmm. Does it also include economic growth or is it something else? I can't speak for the whole of African youth no, because we all have different perspectives. But to me, development is having a clean and safe environment, you know, being healthy, having education, having access to food, having access to water, having access to basic needs, you know, health, education and food. And to some other people, development is having, you know, access to resources. So it could be like, you know, natural resources or extraction. Because when you look at how the global north developed, it developed on the, you know, extraction of resources. So that is why it's developed. Like, you know, it has like big, big buildings, good roads, health systems, you know. To some people, that is development and it's quite ambitious. It's quite different because when you look at the level of education, for example, in the global north, it's quite different from that in the global south. So some people refer that to as development. So I think it depends on where you're standing and what development means to mm -hmm. you. When you look at the history of Africa and that of uh, the global north, most of the resources uh, come from Africa. You know, the extraction, the gold, the diamonds, the cobalt, copper, you know, all those things that the world depend on right now came from Africa. So a continent like Africa has resources, but then they say it's not developed. So it comes from different perspectives of what you understand of development. If I understand you correctly, you do think that sometimes it is important to have some resource extraction, that there are these natural resources that can be used, but the benefits of this extraction is not being distributed. Is, is that how you see it? Or is it so that we should not be extracting these natural resources in any case. It comes back to how these natural resources are extracted. And it also depends on what impact this extraction process will create or will leave. So when you look at, for example, my country, we had copper, we had cobalt, and the British extracted all this even before I was born. I can still see that in my country, what maybe I refer to as development, you know, like access to food, you know, water, good education, good health systems is not available. So it's not there. So what did the resources help us? You know, it wasn't fair or equally because people in my country used to do most of the work in the extraction process. So this was used to develop global north. So that was not fair when you look at the situation that is happening also in other countries, in Senegal, in West Africa, where these resources that are used to make phones or laptops are being extracted, it's not really fair. 
you're right about the fact that during colonization, during the colonial days, there was, of course, an unfair extraction of resources. Natural um, resources were exploited, and all of this was shipped back to the colonial powers. This happened on the African continent. It happened to India. It happened to many colonies. And then finished products were sent back for consumption. So it was almost like you take the resources and then you make money by selling the same products back to the people whose resources were exploited in the first place. But in addition, Hilda, to that, I would also say that in many parts of the world, including in Uganda, you've also seen a rise in inequality in the sense that the resources have been extracted, but it has benefited a small group. I've read several interviews that you've given in the news media about how when Greta Thunberg started doing the uh, the protests on Fridays, mm. Fridays for Future in Sweden, in Stockholm, this inspired a lot of people. And now there's this huge movement all over the world. And particularly in, in your country, there have been several activists and you've been one of the foremost sort of championing for environmental issues. And if I'm not wrong, in 2019, I read somewhere that Uganda's Fridays for Future had over 50, 53,000 young members, which I thought was pretty impressive. What, what is the situation now? Who are these people who are campaigning for climate change issues? I know that your story is very inspiring. You went to university, you learned more about these issues. You became much more aware. You connected the dots about how you grew up your grandmother's uh, land, all of these issues, right? This generation of awareness, that was your story. How are these other 53 more thousand young members, what is attracting them to this movement that you've started? So we all have different stories. We, we all have different experiences. But growing up in a country like mine that faces the effects of climate change firsthand makes most of the inhabitants really victims. So many of the people in Uganda are victimized by climate change because of the experiences they grew up facing. And when we used to carry out these climate awarenesses, the strikes, we used to visit schools, communities, you know, people on the streets and talking about climate change. So everyone had a different story to tell. Everyone related to what we were communicating differently. When we found out that actually people understand what climate change is, but they don't know that what they know is actually climate change. I don't know if you understand me. They related to the effects, to the disasters that they are facing, but they didn't know it was because of climate change. Because it's not taught at the schools, right? Exactly. Yes, it's not taught in schools. So these awareness campaigns help them understand that climate change is real and it's what they are facing and it's what they've grown up seeing. So it helped them relate to what is happening right now and uh, know, help them know and understand that that is really climate change. So we did a lot of outreaches, different communities and in different schools. We've reached out to over 102 schools and we've been working with 72 communities. We've organized 22 climate protests. We've so far established about 27 uh, climate conservation clubs in schools. And we've planted over 120,000 indigenous trees. We've trained over 850 young people in climate advocacy. And we've had like different campaigns on saving Uganda's ecosystems. We've also organized many activities like lake cleanups, so during all these activities, we always create climate awareness. We always talk about our environment and our role as young people in combating climate change. I understand, of course, you've been very successful at creating that awareness. If you have over 50,000 members, obviously this is touching a nerve. Yeah. And given that climate change does not perhaps get the attention that it deserves at, at the school level, this is an important part of that awareness generation um, uh, scheme that is absolutely necessary to mobilize youth 
But apart from creating that awareness, Hilda, what is it that you're telling your government to do more of? What is the advice that young people like you are giving your political leaders? That is a, a good question because for everything that we do or the awareness or the activism, we always have to look up to the leaders or the decision makers because it's where most of the change happens, you know. Our message to leaders, decision makers, is to prioritize climate change, especially in our country. Climate change is not taken as a priority, you know, and that is one of the reasons as to why we are not achieving climate justice, because we don't take it as a priority. We think we can first, you know, look at development or any other things, but not climate change. And that is what needs to be done. We need to listen more. We need to see more. We need to see a lot of change that is happening, but that will only be possible if there's a political will. And that's, that's the political will for us to have it. We need to prioritize climate change. But when we don't do that, then that means we won't achieve it. So we call on our leaders to prioritize climate change because it's really affecting us. And since our country is an agriculture-based country, that means we depend on our environment for our survival. If we don't keep her good and healthy and clean, that means we won't gain, we won't develop, we won't succeed, we won't live. Our future is not guaranteed. But if we prioritize taking care of Mother Earth, of our environment, then we are guaranteed of a safe future, you know, of a clean environment. And that is what needs to be done. If there is political will to see that our environment is safeguarded, healthy, is clean, then we will achieve the development that we are looking for. You know, I've been interacting with many of your politicians over the years, not just in Uganda, but in Kenya, Malawi, Ethiopia, Zambia. Let me put on the hat of a politician, a political leader, mm. and mm. tell you what they tell me. Okay? Mm -hmm. So this is what they would say. You guys from the global north are preaching to us about climate change. You polluted first. You extracted the resources. You got rich. And by the way, now on the African continent, we account only for 3% of the global emissions. Why are you making us the culprit? Why are you targeting us? We have natural resources. We have oil. We have natural gas. We should be allowed to do this extraction. We need jobs. We need economic growth. Some of this income will help build the schools, the hospitals, the roads that we need, the infrastructure. But it does not mean that we don't think about the environment. It does not mean that we don't care about climate change. It's just that we now have found resources and we should be allowed to use them. So stop preaching. Allow us to grow. When poverty is decreased, we will automatically be much more concerned about more climate-friendly actions. Okay, so that is what they tell me. Can you respond to that? Of course. So I will ask them, when will that be achieved? You know, when will you develop? When will you process these, extract these resources? When do you think that you will provide enough food for your people? When will poverty stop? Because we've been fighting the same uh, challenges, the same issues for years, but it seems like, you know, an endless tunnel. And at some point we just need to stop. We just need to pause and think, you know, what is working, what's not, and why it's not working. Because the global north developed on extraction, yes, and we are suffering the effects of that, yes, but we keep accepting and going on with the same systems that they used to develop to make us develop as well. It's not working. 
it's not. So we need to stop, we need to pause and reflect on how to have a sustainable development, you know, because we don't need just a, a few years or two years of development and then we die or everything is messed up. We need development that can sustain our lives, that can sustain the future, a development that your children can be happy of, that they can experience, you know, and that is what really makes the difference. We can't say we, 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 we will be developed for, you know, a few years and then what happens to the rest of the years? What happens to the generations that live before, sorry, that live after us? What are you leaving behind? What have you done in your lifetime that will make other generations celebrate their, their living or enjoy their stay on earth? That's really what makes the difference. It doesn't make sense if we are looking at development and your countrymen are starving. They are dying because of hunger. So who are you developing with? You know, there can't be development if people are starving, if there's poor health systems, if there's, uh, you know, poor education, if people don't even have a home to stay in their own country. That's why we need priorities, you know. We need priorities. So your message in, in a way is to leaders is that please factor in the climate change aspect in development policy. Don't push it towards the future. Think about it while you try to achieve development. Be aware of the climate. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. What then I hear, again, let me don the, the hat of a political leader. They will say, yeah, you know, we are interested. The problem is that we have so much poverty that needs to be addressed first that we really are trying to prioritize. We are trying to attract investments to our countries and we're desperate. We just want investments. We want to create jobs and we need to increase incomes. It's not like we are not interested in environmental issues, but it's just that the pressure, the urgency of poverty reduction means that we can't do the same things that rich countries are doing. So allow us to develop in a slightly less climate-friendly way, you know, to put it bl bluntly. That is what they say. I will tell them that they are not listening enough. They are not hearing. Because when I say, I say, pause and reflect on what's working. For example, Africa, we have a good fertile soils. We have good weather. We produce a lot of food, you know, and we export most of our products. But we export that cheaply, you know, and yet it's really important for the countries that we export to. So how about increasing our prices for our food, you know, that will increase jobs for the people because they will be earning more. It will increase our, you know, growth as countries. It will provide enough jobs for the people because that's what they're looking for. Their incomes will increase. So how about use these sustainable avenues in earning uh, some more money for your people so that you can reduce on the poverty rates, you can reduce, because we are giving so much tax exemptions to international companies, you know, to these uh, extractive companies, to all these people that are doing crazy work in our own countries. And then we are making everything so hard and expensive for our own people in these countries. How about we just pause and we just change the systems that are happening because they're not working. How about prioritize uh, a safe environment, you know? Because if we grow more crops, that means we will have enough food at the market. It can sustain the export and it can also feed the people, reduce poverty. How about we use some of these ways in combating uh, the challenges that we are facing rather than putting everything on other people, like, you know, depending on other people, yet we can we can find other means of how we can develop, but not depending on other people. 
Yeah, you know, I'm thinking about my last trip to Uganda, to Kampala. This was many years ago. I haven't been back, I think, what, for four, five, six years. But I still vividly remember every time I've been to Kampala, one thing that I always do, you know, is to walk down to the bus stop, you know, that bus station where it's like a bus depot. Yeah, taxi. And uh, the taxi depot, yeah, (laughs) the minibuses, right? And they're all white colored and... (laughs) You walk down that road and you see this wonderful overview and you see, it's just amazing. All these very old imported minibuses from Japan, I think mainly, they are emitting black smoke, often very polluting. But what amazes me, apart from all the pollution, is also how that bus depot is structured. You know, it's amazing how all of these I don't know, hundreds or thousands of minibuses and taxis move in and out. Now, what I know that a lot of my colleagues, friends, and and people I speak with in Kampala, as in Addis and many other African capitals are concerned with, is this growing air pollution. And, Mm. you know, that that is very visible. You see the black smoke, you're coughing, and a lot of leaders and citizens are interested in that. So pollution is this kind of visible problem that I would argue elicits some political interest and attention that something that will happen in the future that is climate induced does not seem as visible, but something that is close to you gets a lot of attention. And in relation to that, I noticed that I've seen pictures of you uh, sitting in the middle of that big roundabout in Kampala and protesting and having the Fridays for Future protest, sitting there sometimes on your own, I think in the in, in the early days with a placard talking about this and you are inhaling all of that pollution. Yeah. How has that journey been? How do people actually respond to you, this young woman holding up a sign, do they dismiss you? Do they take you more seriously now than they did before? Yeah. So uh, air pollution is indeed a very big challenge. And some research that was done a few years ago showed that Kampala, which is the capital city of Uganda, is one of the most polluted cities in Africa. I've seen the rates at which people in Uganda are getting health-related issues because of this pollution. I've seen how people are dying because of this air pollution. And it's indeed a very big challenge. And that is why we try to address this issue when we are creating climate awareness. And it's one of the examples that we use to make people understand that our human activities are affecting us. Like we are killing our own selves, you know. What we used to do is we used to move to the street. In the early days, I was alone, but now we are a team. So we used to move to the street and talk to people about this. Uh, You talked about the taxi park in Kampala. We've been there and we had different, different perspectives about what people think about the climate strikes. So some would ask us, so are they, are these people really listening? Like the people we are talking to, like, are they really listening and understanding? And some would tell us, you can tell that to politicians or decision makers because we don't do anything. Some people will tell us that how long are we left with to die? That's a question we never (laughs) answer. (laughs) And some people would tell us what can we do? Like, you know, we are just people in the system. We are not the ones who created it. Like, what can we do as people? We don't have power. We don't have nothing. And there were different, different questions. But I would approach this in a way that we all have a responsibility to play and that the independent decisions that we make affect the way other people live and it affects our, the, the lives of our family members. It affects how other people also live because when, for example, I... I, I buy plastic, you know, I buy a water bottle and then I drink and then after I throw that away, another person will see that and do the same. So my decision of throwing that water bottle away is impacting other people around me because this will end up in the trenches and then the trenches will block And then when they block, other people will suffer because when it rains, water will just flood, you know. 
So we try to explain to them in such a way that the individual decisions they make affect each and everyone. It doesn't affect only them. And that they also have a role to play in creating, for example, climate awareness, in doing the small actions that they can do in their communities, you know. It so happened that most of these people were telling a story of how they came from the village and they had their plantations and their plantations were devastated by climate change and that's why they gave up they gave up farming to come and do the driving you know and that is exactly what i used as an example like why would you leave farming it's because of these reasons that we don't understand where our life is headed yeah and it's because of the challenges that we face that we make decisions that may or may not be good for us so those are some of the examples we use to explain to them that, you know, climate change is real and the effects that happened, you know, the rains or the droughts that happened to your plantation are some of the diverse effects of climate change. Some are human induced, some are natural. Yeah. So one of the things I hear when I interact with taxi drivers or people in that taxi park who are driving very old imported uh, second, third, fourth hand vehicles from Europe or from Japan, they say that, tell us the alternative. Mm. You know, as you said, they came from the villages, they were farmers, and now they're looking for a better life. They want to send money back. And the only alternative that is available is a polluting diesel car. So they say, well, you know, if you gave us an alternative, if it was cheaper to buy a new car that did not pollute as much, we would do it. But we don't yeah. have the money. And that's why we do it. And recently, you know, I was in uh, Ethiopia and Addis and uh, the Ethiopian government has started this ambitious policy to encourage electric cars, just like we have in Norway. But then the criticism is that, well, you can have electric cars, but where are the charging points? You need to have fast chargers. You need to have that infrastructure. So. I think these are some of the issues that I often hear. It's like, you're telling us to be better in terms of not polluting the environment, but you're not really giving us a proper alternative. Yeah. Is that what you also hear? Yeah, because it's quite different. When we had the discussion about electric cars, our president uh, said this on uh, national media, and it was a joke. In Uganda, it was a joke because we produce a lot of electricity and supply other countries, but then our own people don't have electricity, you know, like we often have electricity load sheds and it's quite alarming because if we have enough and we export to other countries, then why don't we, why don't yeah. our houses have? So it was a joke because why would we have electric cars? Yet we don't even have enough electricity in our houses. So it came as a job to many Ugandans. But when we, with Fridays for Future, I mean, we Fridays for Future Uganda try to do these activities and awarenesses in communities, we always give alternatives. And that is okay. how our projects come about because we go in these communities, see what challenges they are facing, talk to them. We can't just talk and just let it be. So, for example, we have a lake cleanup activity uh, on uh, shores around uh, Lake Victoria. And after this cleanup, we collect the waste, but we do not uh, leave the waste there. We make sure that we use this waste to make other things. For example, we sort this waste with plastics, you know, and biodegradable waste to compost. And then we give the plastic to to the children, like the school dropouts, so that they can sell the plastic and get some money. And then we use the biodegradable waste or the compost to make energy efficient briquettes. These are an alternative to firewood, to charcoal, because these firewood and charcoal are, are sources of energy, but then we need to cut trees for us to get that. 
you know, and it's not a, a healthy decision because they produce also some toxic air mm -hmm. that affects health, especially for women who do most of the cooking at home. But if uh, we use this biodegradable waste to make these energy efficient briquettes, these briquettes are eco-friendly because they come from the waste, you know, and they don't produce as much bad air as the firewood and the charcoal. So these are some of the alternatives we give to these communities where we work. And we have seen them working, you know. It started as something that cannot, you know, sustain anyone. But now we work with women groups and they are earning from these briquettes. I'm glad to hear that because I think that has been, at least in my view, Hilda, one of the big problems is that we tell people do this differently, mm. farm differently, adopt a different way of life. And yet we're not really showing them what the genuinely viable alternatives are. We're just telling them, we're just preaching and hoping that they will take the risk, change mm -hmm. their, their farming techniques, etc. But they are stuck with all the risk. If there's a loss of crops, if that new technique that is more climate smart does not work, then they're stuck with all the risk. So I think there's something there to show that there is a genuinely viable alternative. Let's move on to something that I know you've been uh, very concerned with, and that is your country discovered oil in, uh, was it 2006? And now there's this huge project called the East African Crude Oil Pipeline Project, ECOP for short, that has been uh, implemented over the last few years. It's a pipeline that will transport oil from Uganda's Lake Albert oil fields to the port of Tanga in Tanzania. Yeah. And then this oil that is transported from Uganda will be sold to world markets. This is... Mm. 1,443 kilometer long oil pipeline. It is the longest heated pipeline in the world. And we have some major players involved. You have the China National Oil Corporation, uh, the French energy giant Total Energies, together with Uganda's National Oil Company and the Tanzania Petroleum Development Corporation. So all of these people uh, or these actors are involved. The uh, politicians on both sides are very much for this. There's Chinese assistance, French assistance, and yet you, Hilda, you've argued that this new oil and gas projects such as the ECOP are simply, and I quote, I read somewhere, a ticket to hell. That's what you've said. We cannot develop on a dead planet, you said. Tell us what is the problem with this, this pipeline? Uganda's found oil. It wants to use these resources. It hopes that this will help combat poverty. What is the big objection you have to this? Yeah. So uh, the first big objection is you said it, that the oil is coming from Lake Albert in Uganda, and it goes through Uganda, through Tanzania to the coast of Tanga. That is long. And it's being exported to another country and refined and then brought back expensively. And at some point, we said this in our discussion with you today, that resources are being extracted in African countries and taken and refined and developed in other countries and then sold back expensively for us to buy them. So this is the same issue because this is the trend that developed countries or countries in the global north have been using to develop themselves and telling countries like mine that they will develop if they do that to them, you know? So this is still a colonial mindset that is still happening. It's just revolving. And the fact that Total Energies has over 62% of the pipeline is also a very big problem, you know, because Uganda as a country has just 15% shares from this project. Tanzania as a country has also 15% shares. Total Energies has 62% shares. And that is why it's not viable. That is why this is not an economically viable project because our country is looking at development from this project, but it's not economically viable if you look at it. It has a lot of um, challenges that it's causing. One of it being environmental degradation, you know, 
we, we are already facing the effects of climate change. We've talked about the air pollution in Kampala that is really at, at the bar. Uh, we have talked about the floods, the droughts that are happening in my country. And with this project, all these will be exacerbated, you know. It will be, you know, multiplied. We will be facing even more extreme weather events if this project happens because it's estimated to emit 32.3 million metric tons of carbon a year and this is just for the exploration part so that doesn't involve the transportation and every other thing so that means there will be even expected to increase you know the emissions and at the moment we are trying to reduce you know the carbon emissions in order to stay below 1.2 degrees celsius sorry 1.5 so hilda should we leave this oil below mm -hmm. the ground should it be untouched uganda should not use this resource according to you uganda wants to develop right because that's mm -hmm. what our president is saying and we are giving a safer alternative of what development is yeah we have our agriculture systems we have tourism systems we have fishery systems these are one of the biggest contributors to our gdp how about we invest in these to develop our country our own country you know so we can develop even without oil because it was discovered a few years ago but before that we had lifestyles we'd left like we've been surviving. So how about we invest in what we already have so that it's not damaged or impacted by the oil pipeline? Because this is just going to be for a few years, you know? And what will happen when oil is over? The argument I hear from your leaders is that it is precisely because we need the money to invest in agriculture, in education, in health, that we will get from the sale of this oil that will promote the kind of development that you're talking about. So, of course, you've already highlighted that maybe Uganda should benefit much more from this, this project mm. than it does. So that's one thing. Mm. But there's also the criticism, as I understand it, about the pollution, the environmental aspect. But I've also seen the reaction from the company saying, hey, come on, the pipeline is buried. And once the topsoil and vegetation have been reinstated, then people and animals will be able to cross freely anywhere. So wildlife won't be impacted, except for some of those big towers or something that will be built, right? Some of the junctions for the pipe. So the response I hear, I'm not saying that I agree necessarily. I just wanted you to reflect on that, is that all those investments you're talking about, Hilda, that is needed in all of these other sectors, at the moment, there's no money. And if Uganda has the oil, the argument is let's use it Mm -hmm. But we'll use it wisely. And uh, yes, some of this will create more pollution, but this is what we have. And if we don't use this natural resource that belongs to us, that'll be a shame. In fact, it's the rich countries that should uh, should stop selling their oil. They shouldn't be exploring, but we should. So, so that is what I hear. Do you hear the same argument? I would say one thing, you know, prevention is better than cure. What our leaders are saying that they should, uh, we should use our oil and then get money and then invest more in agriculture, tourism, and fisheries. And these are the same industries that are being affected by the pipeline. So it's like when we get the money, we will, you know, cure whatever challenge there will be. I know that curing is really expensive. Yeah. <laughs> And it's better to prevent the challenges that are coming than actually, you know, looking up to the future. So what would be the best alternative is to leave the oil in the ground. Because first of all, look at what we are gaining, you know, what is the positive impact that is coming from it and what is the negative impact? Just weigh these options. Are we gaining or are we losing? You know, that will give us a, a very clear picture. And in this, Uganda is losing. Yes, we are getting some money, but we are we have the most to lose. That includes our environment, 
that includes our health systems, that includes our agriculture, tourism, fisheries, it's being affected because we are not getting money from this. We have 15% shares. This can't be enough for the country if Total as a company has over 62% shares and yet the oil is coming from Uganda. If the oil is ours, then why don't we have the biggest percentage? I know it, it involves very many other things. They say they'll be investing their resources for the exploration. They're using their money, you know, to, to yeah. construct, etc. So that that's the typical narrative. Yes, but 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 then when you also think about other things where Uganda or other avenues where Uganda would have earned is through the taxes. Because these are multinational companies and if they have any business in the country, they have to pay taxes. But then for this case, they have a 10-year tax exemption. It's ridiculous. Like if you have a tax exemption, that means you're allowed to do what you want without paying taxes. So how will the people benefit? You know, they say that they are going to provide jobs to the people, but they are getting more of these expertise jobs to, you know, companies outside and the people in Uganda are not being employed for these jobs. They are being employed in the low paying jobs that are even temporary. So who is benefiting and who is not? It's benefiting other people, but not the citizens themselves. So where is development in all this? The project has just started, but people are already being affected by the pollution, by the uh, being displaced and not fully compensated. People are being chased off their land. We are seeing these arguments. Animals are running away from the parks, you know, looking for better habitants because the roads have been constructed through the park because there's so much noise, there's so much heat, there's so much dust coming from these uh, extraction processes. So how will it be five years from now? What will happen? Our biodiversity is shrinking very fast even without the pipeline. So what will happen when the pipeline is created, you know? It's a sack of events that we have to weigh where we gain and where we don't in order for us to, you know, see whether we can do this or not. Because I think there are better ways how Uganda can develop without extracting oil. Hilda, I know that you've attended some of these COP, the climate change conferences over the years. I know you were in Glasgow. I don't know if you were you in Egypt. Yeah, yes, I was in Egypt, and which was touted to be Africa's COP, and there was mm-hmm. considerable interest in energy security. Everybody was talking about gas and oil. There were some criticisms that the oil and gas lobbies were dominating. Mm-hmm. How has it been for you to interact with policymakers, with official negotiators at these big conferences, voicing the views and dreams and aspirations of African youth? Mm-hmm. What did you take away from these meetings? Is it sometimes encouraging, but often frustrating? How do you view these big gatherings? I've never been to one of these conferences. How is it for you to be there? Do you leave these gatherings with some sense of hope or is it just doom and gloom? Well, it's frustrating to be part of these conferences, honestly, because there's a lot going on at the same time and a lot needs to be done in just those two weeks. So everyone is always on the move. That even when you meet a decision maker, politicians, they are there, but they are not there mentally. (laughs) I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So you will speak to them. But they won't listen, you know, because they have an agenda that they are driving, that they are trying to push. But I would say that the noise that is being made by the youth movement in these spaces is really, really very important. Youth participation has moved many things, including policies, including decision making. And I'm very certain that if it wasn't for youth participation, the loss and damage agreement that was reached at COP27 last year wouldn't have never happened. But it's because of this, the solidarity, the actions we do, the noise that we make that help leaders know that, hey, something needs to be done about this. So I'm still very positive that our 
voices and our participation in these uh, spaces, in these conferences is really, really vital to making certain decisions for our own future. One final set of issues relates to the fact that Africa, the continent of Africa, this huge continent, has so many young people. It's a very young continent. Mm -hmm. In some countries, you know, you have most of the majority of the population is below 18 years of age. It's a very Mm -hmm. young continent. And yet a lot of the leaders of these countries are very old men. It's almost like you have to be over 80 years old to be the president of some of these countries. <laughs> One of the things I've noticed you mentioned several times in, in many of your news reports, etc., is that the government is hearing us, but it is not listening to us. If you are young, you're not considered to be influential. You're not important. You don't have the experience. You don't know what you're talking about. That is how young people are often viewed or treated, not just in Africa. It also happens in many other parts of the world. But My final question to you, Hilda, is what is required for young people to be taken more seriously? People like you, is it support from older people like me? What is it that is required for the youth to be heard more? Well, the youth have been speaking for quite a while, but like I always say, we are not being listened to. And that is what is required. If only they can listen to what we have to say, that would make a very big difference, you know, because we've been talking, we've been campaigning, we've been striking, you know, we've been protesting, but we are not being listened to because everyone thinks that what they are doing has so much influence or it has it's what they really need to do. But like I said, when we were starting, sometimes we need to just pause and think about what is working and what is not instead of just pushing. And that is what the youth have seen, you know, because we are leaving the decisions that these people in power are making. So we are in, we are best situated to draw from this experience that we have lived to advise correctly on what is working and what is not. We've seen this happening. We are very hopeful about our future. We know what we want and we are trying to speak up. Could you start a political movement? Could you have, could you influence politics through the creation of a political party, through existing political parties? Because that's what a lot of other movements have tried to do, that social movements or any of these movements sort of, mm-hmm. you know, they create awareness, but in order to really impact politics, it has to be in the political realm. Is that something that you've considered? Well, it's ish-ish, I would say, because I wouldn't start a political movement. I really believe that the power of the youth climate movement is you know, bigger and stronger than the politicians themselves. So if we just uh, utilize this power that we have collectively, we can push. Uh, I've seen that all the work we have been doing has already influenced policy and decision making. And that means if we get together and do more, we can change this. Political parties are, you know, it's huge because sometimes they have limitations on what they have to do. And that really challenges them on making some decisions in line with what is what is the right way of moving ahead. And I wouldn't want to be in such a position where I have to make a decision for the few people that, you know, have big power than the bigger picture. But I also want to emphasize that rule change will also happen if there is political will. And that means that youth movements or other social movements have to work hand in hand with decision makers, with politicians in order to bring this, to drive this change home. Yeah. Hilda, it was wonderful to see you again. Thank you so much for coming on my program. Thank you for having me this early in the morning. (laughs) (laughs) Have a wonderful day, Hilda. Thank you, Dan. Have a wonderful day. If you enjoyed this conversation, please spread the news among friends and colleagues and share the link to the podcast on social media. You can tag us on Twitter at Global Dev Pod and Dan Bannock. 
Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.